Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the morning church service here at Victory Baptist Church. Yes, once again, we are live streaming everything because of the COVID-19 situation. Please continue to pray for the entire situation. Pray for the church. Pray for one another. Pray for our country. Pray for all the uh, different ways people are being impacted. But let's, as we continue to pray for all of those things, continue to try to live through this new reality that we are experiencing. The one thing that we can do, no matter where we are, no matter what the situation we're facing, we can always turn our attention back to the Word of God. We can turn our attention to worshiping God. So let's do that uh, this morning. Let's begin with two hymns to turn and set our minds on the things above, not on things below. And uh, let's be ready to not only worship, but then ready, be ready to hear the Word of God preached. All right, so let's begin this morning with two hymns.
All right, if you have a Bible, the book of Romans chapter 5, the book of Romans chapter 5, as we continue our journey through the book of Romans, our study of the book of Romans, we it's it feels like it's been uh, it feels like it's been like 10 years. Ta- I think time has lost all meaning during uh this whole COVID-19 situation, but yes, we've covered a lot. We've dealt with a lot of issues. But what we need to do is just remind ourselves of some of the basic concepts, all right? I want to make this very clear. There are plenty of things that we've looked at so far in Romans that there could be, I mean, there could be lots of disagreement. There could be lots of struggle, like trying to figure out why Paul wrote that we're going to be judged according to our deeds. And then and then elaborates that verse after verse after verse saying, hey, if you do good, you get great. You know, great. If you do bad, judgment. Wait, why? Why is he saying that? We, we struggled with that, and we tried to answer some questions, and we tried to come up with a solution. And I and I am glad and appreciative that the church allowed all of that time and all of that struggle and all of that work because it wasn't easy work and it was tedious, but it was important to try to be to try to be fair to the text. I mean, when the text presents a problem, we have to struggle with it. But in spite of all of those things that some we may not still have a good answer for, and there's going to be other things we may not have a good answer for, we can at least write down these things that we can be absolutely positive about. These things that I think are clear in the book of Romans, and we have seen them in our study. The first thing that we can be absolutely clear about, the first thing that we can be 100% clear on is this, the need for justification. There is no dispute, there is no debate that in the first couple of chapters of the book of Romans, it screams to you and it screams to me, we need we need to be justified by God because we are sinners. We need justification, we need salvation because we are sinners. We fall short of the glory of God. We sin. Uh, everything we do, uh, no one seeketh after God. No, not one. I mean, it has driven home the fact that you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, and we deserve judgment. So we need, we, we see the need for justification. How can I be made just before a holy God? We have seen that. It is clear. There may be some things about it that are unclear. There may be some things that people want to argue about, but that part just screams, hey, we need, we need salvation because we are sinners. I mean, it screams that to us. So so the need for justification is made clear. Second thing that has been, I think, very clear in our study of Romans is we have seen justification explained. We've seen it explained. Now, I know that there's been so much dispute in church history over it, but when you read Romans, look, I know we can run to James and we can run to other passages, but just reading Romans the way justification is explained, it seems be, to be pretty clear, right? We are justified by faith. By faith, we are declared righteous. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to our account. Christ propitiated, satisfied the wrath of God on our behalf. Christ died for us. We are justified in him. I think that that has been absolutely explained I, look, I, I know there there will be debates throughout the rest of church history about it, but I think it's been explained about as clearly as it can be. And just to ensure that we, if we were not completely convinced by the explanation, then Paul spent some time in Romans ec- illustrating justification. And we have clearly seen justification illustrated in the life of Abraham and the life of David. He he used, I'm going to choke here. He used the life of uh, Abraham and the life of David to illustrate to us justification. So there could be no confusion. There could be no argument. And what did we see? Abraham was declared righteous before he did anything. All those great things that we talk about, before he did any of that, he was declared righteous. And he was declared righteous. How, class? Everyone should say, by faith, and by faith alone. I mean, clearly, even though the text doesn't use the word alone, it's implied, it's screamed that that's the way it was done. And then, of course, in David, I mean, talk about a man who needed to be justified by faith. His life demonstrated 
uh, a mess at times. I mean, if we look at everything that David did wrong, there was a lot of things he did wrong. But listen, the righteousness that's imputed to you never has done wrong, will do wrong, can do wrong, because it's the righteousness of Christ. And then we saw and kind of a powerful illustration of how uh, Abraham and Sarah were brought to a point where they could not produce the promises of God. They could not do so. They could not, they were brought to physically, their body was dead physically from producing the promises of God. So all they could do is believe in a God who could bring something out of nothing, who could bring back, who could bring back, who could bring life from death, could bring back the dead. He, in a sense, brought their bodies back from the dead to produce the promises, but it was by faith they had to believe in this. They could not do it. They were incapable, and we, and that illustrates the whole idea of justification. You're incapable, I'm incapable, we're all incapable. We have to, by faith, trust in the God who isn't incapable, but is more than capable, and who has done it on, and, on, and, and on our behalf, on your behalf, my behalf. All right, so those are things that we just absolutely have to have written down. And, and, and please have those things down. Please remember them, note them, understand them, because when, there's going to be things in the book of Romans at times we're going to be like, I don't get this. I, I, don't, I don't understand how this works. Well, remember those things, all right? We're going to get into some controversial chapters moving forward. We're going to get into, wait, are we dead to sin? If we're dead to sin, then why do we sin? Wait, how are we set free from sin? Wait, is the old man been is the old man dead or is the old man still alive? Wait a minute. Okay. What's this whole election thing? Okay. Wait, that's going to be controversial. Wait, Israel is God done with Israel? Is he not done with Israel? How do we understand Israel? There's we've got lots of chapters to deal with some very controversial issues. Let's cling to what we can know. Sometimes we can become preoccupied with what we don't know and can't know. But typically in every book that we struggle through, there's always things we can know. And if we could know, if we can know the things we can know better than we currently know them, then we can grow in a greater certainty and a greater amount of unity. Sometimes if we all know what we can know and know it to the best of our ability, then we can at least be unified in what we can know and that can keep us strong when we find the things that we won't be in agreement on because there'll be plenty of them, all right? So just kind of a word of encouragement there, a word uh, to just remind you of, 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 of how to sometimes approach all the difficulties in a book. Go back to those things you do know, all right? Now, we say all of that because we now have reached a section and we, and we started it last week. Now we, we have moved from... The need for justification, justification explained, justification illustrated, and we can we can know we need justification. We can know what justification is because it was explained. We can know what justification is because it's been illustrated, and now we can know what the results of justification are and what the re- results of justification is. This is not something for a history book. If you are saved, if you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and his righteousness has been imputed to your account, there are some results that come from that justification that you should be experiencing right now as I speak. And these are the things that we all have in common. All right, we all have these things in common. All right, so let's go through them. Go to Romans chapter five. Romans chapter five, look in verse one. Romans chapter five, verse one. Therefore, so he's he's done all of this illustrating justification. He's done his explaining of justification. He's clearly demonstrated we need justification. Therefore, being justified by faith. There you have it. How are we justified? By faith. How are we justified? By faith. How are we justified? By faith. How are we justified by faith? I'm just going to keep saying it. How are we justified by faith? Make sure you have that down. Therefore, being justified by faith. Now, here comes the first result. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We now are at peace with God. We have peace with God. The war between us and God is over. It is finished. 
It is done. And we have this peace with God because of Jesus Christ. He satisfied God's wrath towards us. He provided the righteousness to us that pleases God. God's wrath has been satisfied. God's demand for holiness has been met. We have the righteousness of God. We can stand in front of God without any worry about a war, about any conflict. It was finished. Peace has been provided by the cross of Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. Our sins are taken care of. The wrath of God is taken care of. It's finished. All of our sins of our past are done. They're taken care of. We now are at peace with God. We may not be at peace with each other. We at times uh, within Christianity, we're at war with each other at sometimes it seems, but we have peace with God. And hopefully that peace with God would bring peace to one another, but that's a whole different sermon because the result here of your justification is peace with God, all right? I, there's so much I could say, but I don't want to re-preach that sermon, all right? The second thing we have, all right, we have peace with God. Number two, by whom? Speaking of Jesus Christ, because please note the end of verse one, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it is through Christ that we have peace with God and by whom, by Christ, also we have access by faith into this grace. The second thing we have is access into the grace of God. We can approach the throne of grace. We can approach God. We have access to grace. And why? And because we're justified by faith and we have peace with God, why do we need grace? We need grace to sustain us. We need grace to strengthen us. We need the grace of God because we're going to continue to sin in our practice. We're going to continue to fail God over and over and over and over again. But guess what? You have access to grace and it is in that grace that you stand. You don't stand in what you can do. You stand in the grace of God, right? That's very important. There's a lot more I could say there, but let me read uh, the whole uh, verse. By whom also we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand and, and, and then we'll stop right there. We stand in this grace of God. Now, this comes to the third thing, third result that we Uh, from our justification. The third thing that we experience because of our justification, and now this one is going to be very important for where we're going today. We stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The third thing we have is a hope, a hope of the glory of God. I, I wrote it down this way. Oh, I, yeah, I think I actually put down hope of the glory of God. Had to, uh, it's for for those listening. Please note when I when I'm doing my sermon from this microphone, I'm not using my wireless mic standing at the pulpit, and it's really odd. Like I have my notes, and typically I would just have my notes sitting on the pulpit, and I could just look down. So I've got to try to pick up my Bible, then I got to put it down. And the mic is right in front of me. So sometimes it it comes across a little awkward and I apologize for that. It definitely feels awkward uh, because uh, typically if I'm doing a podcast, I don't have as many notes and things. So it's not as as weird, but all right, you, you get the idea. So the third result of your justification is hope of the glory of God. I know what do we mean by that? Well, we have a, this idea of hope, we have an assurance we have an assurance. We, we, it's a certainty that we will experience the glory of God. We will experience glory. And the reason we have this hope, the reason we have this certainty, the reason we have this assurance is because our justification is by faith alone. It's because by faith we are declared righteous. So now that I have an absolute assurance of one day I will be in the presence of God, I will experience glorification. My my sinful body will be, I'll end up with a glorified body, no more pain, no more suffering, and no more death. I have that assurance, right? That's very important. And we, one of the passages we look to kind of supplement this or to add to it is Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, look at verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We all know verse 28. And we, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, please note how this works, he foreknows, he predestines, and for those he uh, foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he called, And whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, he glorified. Please note how that works. All right. The ones God foreknows, he predestinates. And the ones he predestinates, he calls. And the ones he calls, he justifies. All right. Now, and he also glorified. He also glorified. There is the guarantee. We have a hope of glorification because it's all done by God. He foreknow, he foreknew, he predestines, he calls, he justifies, he glorifies. You can have hope. You can rejoice in that and you can celebrate that and you should. Now, and then we talked about just briefly, just remind you how all of these things that we looked at last week, They deal with the past, present, and future. Past, we have peace with God. Takes care of the past. No longer, he no longer holds our sin against us. All right, this access, uh, the, the present is taken care of by the access to God. It takes care of the present because we can come to him anytime. And our future is taken care of because we have the hope of glory of God. It takes care of the future. We we have this hope of the glory of God, the certainty. So our past is taken care of, our present is taken care of, and our future is taken care of. All good news. Now, I say all of that because now we come to the next one, and this is the only one we're going to cover today. I think we're only going to cover one, right? So I spent a little bit more time in review because I don't because we're I just I, this is a situation where I don't want to cover I could cover a lot but I want you to really get this one. I want you to because this one is this one is, is screams it screams at us because it is so relevant to your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday living. Peace with God, access with God the hope of the future, some of those things uh, may seem very, you know, it deals more with maybe you may view it dealing with your position. You may not see the practical application, but this one does, all right? So I want you to really get your mind and, and think on this one, all right? Here we go. Let me read verse two. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope for the, of the glory of God. Now look at verse three. And not only so, right? And not only so, not just this, not just this uh, idea of this future glory that we are a certain certainty of, not only so, now look carefully, but we glory in tribulations also. Now stop right there, all right? We don't just rejoice uh, in the glory of God as far as the future eternal state, but we glory. In fact, this idea we glory means to joy, to rejoice, to boast. We don't just glory. We don't just joy. We just uh, we don't just rejoice. We don't just boast in the future certainty. Yeah. Now we can do that. We can hey. You know, no matter how bad things get here, I, I, I can glory, I can boast, I can have joy, I can rejoice that the future is certain. The world may crumble and fall apart, but future glory is a certainty. You can do that, but there's something else we get in justification. We get the ability to glory, to, to have joy, to boast in something else. And what is that something else? Note carefully, verse three, tribulations, tribulations. Now, I want you to write down that word because it is very important, all right? 
we we have to we have to understand that this now becomes very practical. We're not looking to something in the future. We're looking to right here, right now, tribulations. And we have to ask ourselves, we have to answer a very important question here, right? Because I could just jump launch into preaching this, but we really have to spend some time building a foundation because guess what? There's disagreement in Christianity. I know, shocking. What are these tribulations that we are told that we can now glory in? What are these tribulations? Not everyone agrees. In fact, let me, I think I have it here. Um, I think it's page 281 of this commentary that I have here in front of me. 282. All right, 281. I want you to listen carefully. So what we, we, ha- we have to answer the question before we can really even get into how this works in your Christian life and my Christian life. We have to figure out what these tribulations are. Are there a specific kind of tribulation? Is this a general thing? How do we understand this? And and I and I want you to really put your thinking caps on because there's two theories, all right? And I'm going to say theories, and the reason I'm going to say theories is because everyone has their idea, and I don't know if any one person has proved their idea better than another, all right? But we'll go with this commentary and see what they have to say. All right, here we go. Page 281 of the commentary I have in my hands. You can hear it. This is what they have to say. All right. The tribulations of which Paul is speaking are not the troubles that are common to all mankind, but to troubles that Christians suffer for the sake of their Lord. All right, now, this seems to place the tribulations more in the category of persecution, more in the things that we suffer because we are Christians, the things that we endure because we are Christians. And, and we, we could, I mean, that's what's one theory. We'll just say that's one theory, all right? It limits this. So it would go like this. Before you, we can even apply this and you say, okay, I can glory in my tribulations. If we limit this, you would have to first identify, does your quote unquote tribulation meet the criteria? Are you facing this because you are a Christian? Are you suffering this because you are a Christian, right? Are you, are you going through this because you are a Christian? If you are, then you can glory in that tribulation. If it's just something common to man, then it doesn't, it doesn't apply. All right. That's view number one. View number two is no, this is just, this is just speaking of we can glory in any tribulation, in any trouble, in any trial, right? In fact, some may place, in fact, some commentaries give us a cross reference to this. They take us to uh, John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verse 33. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I've spoken unto you that you might have peace in the world, um, or you, that you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, the other commentaries say, no, that tribulation there is just in the world, you're going to face all kinds of difficulties all kinds of trials, all kinds of tribulations. It's not, Jesus is not saying there, hey, uh, you're you're going to experience persecution. That is just referring to persecution. Some may try to use John 16, 33 to argue, no, he even there he's limiting tribulation. So how do we understand the tribulation mentioned here? Well, let's do this really quick. See if this gives us an answer. Now you may have your own answer, and that's okay. You can you can be wrong if you want. Um, that's a joke. Don't get offended. All right? Hang on. I'm trying to pull up my interlinear here. If we look up the word here, tribulations. Yeah, I think it's yeah, I think it's using the same Greek word. Uh, that Greek word is. See if I have it here. I can play it for you. Strong's G twenty three forty seven. Philipsis. Philipsis. 
Now, if you look at that word, the meaning of that word or how it's used, I mean, the word, uh, the Strong's definition, it means pressure, literal or figurative, afflicted, anguished, burdened. It can mean persecution, tribulation, trouble. It's used in the following ways. It, it, it can speak of oppressing, pressing together, pressure, oppression, affliction, tribulation, distress, straits. It's used 45 times and 43 verses. And I could go through all the different ways that it's used. Now, I guess what we could do, um, we could go through this and, and ask ourselves if at every, if every time is it used only to speak of persecution. Now we could go through that and see, even if it, even if every time it's used, it seems to be referring to persecution, which I think a large amount of the time it is. I don't know if that would even allow me to restrict the meaning of the word. I don't know if the meaning here is, hey, look, as a Christian, because you are justified, not only do you glory in the future, you are to glory in tribulation. You are to rejoice and and boast in tribulations you face. But the only tribulations you can do this in are tribulations you are experiencing and suffering because you are a Christian. I, I, I have faced lots of persecution or, or I have faced a lot of trials and tribulations in my life. I don't, I can't say that I have just because I'm a Christian. I, I don't know if, I, I don't know how you work that. I don't know how you distinguish that. Well, see, my house burnt down. My house caught on fire. Well, I'm a Christian. So maybe it burnt down because I'm a Christian. Okay. I can glory in it or nope. Don't have to glory in that. Uh, my house burnt down, but it burnt uh, three houses in the neighborhood burnt down. And because uh, the other two burnt down weren't Christians, then then mine didn't burn down because I guess I can't I guess I can't rejoice in that. I guess I can't uh, boast in that. I don't know why there's a disagreement on this subject within Christianity. Uh, it's just amazing how we can disagree on pretty much anything. But there seems to be a disagreement here. So you can tell me what you think. I'm going to apply this in a broader scale. I'm going to I'm going to apply it beyond just suffering suffering persecution. I'm going to I'm going to apply it beyond I lost my job because I'm a Christian. Um, I'm I'm going to apply this to all difficulties that we face as a Christian. Listen, as a Christian, because of our justification, we. View, listen, because of our justification, this is a result of our justification, we can now perceive and see all difficulty, all trial, all frustrations differently than we could before we are we were saved. Before salvation, the way we would view tribulation, trial, difficulty as the unfortunate circumstances that occur in life. Right? Hey, unfortunate that that happened. Isn't that sad that that person got cancer? Isn't it horrible that I lost my job? Isn't it horrible? We just see it as the un, you know, unfortunate circumstances or tragic circumstances that befalls people in life. I mean, I mean, it 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 rains on the just and the unjust. It 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 you know, it, uh, it good days come on the just and the unjust. Bad days come on the just. Bad things happen in life. We live in a fallen world. People get sick, people die, people lose their jobs. There's tragedy, there's difficulties, there's frustrations. And and without justification, it's just the unforeseen, unfortunate circumstances that happen or tragic circumstances. There's no rhyme, there's no reason, there's no purpose, they just happen. But once you become justified, you now view life from a spiritual perspective. And I think this is where Paul is going here because look at what he does here. Let's look at this. All right, go back to Romans chapter five. So we have kind of a dispute about the word, but you, you can you can tell me what you think. You can uh, put it in the chat here when we're done or you can type it now and I'll read it later. All right, so let's go through this. All right, so remember, we're justified by faith, so we have peace with God. Great. We have access. Wonderful. So glad we have access. Number three, I have hope in the glory of God. I can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I can rejoice, celebrate in the future glory. However, not only so, he stresses that, not only so the future, but we glory in 
tribulations also. And the tribulations right now that you're enduring, you are to glory in it. You can glory in it. You can rejoice in it. Why? Listen, listen carefully to what happens here. Knowing, now circle the word knowing. The reason you can approach this differently is because you know something. You have knowledge now. You have knowledge. Please note, when you are justified, you come to faith in God. You have a knowledge that you did not presently possess. You have knowledge now of God working. You have the knowledge of God intimately involved, that he sent his son to die for you. You have the knowledge of there is a God. There is a spiritual reality. There is a heaven. There is a hell. God, you begin to know God. You begin to know of God, which changes your perception. You no longer perceive life just by looking at the material, looking at what you can see, touch, and feel. You now, you know of a God that transcends the material. He, you, you, you have knowledge now of a spiritual world. And because of this knowledge, you know something now. And what are you to know? Right? Now look. Knowing... That tribulation worketh. Stop right there. All right. You now know that tribulation, trial, difficulty is working. It is working. It's doing something. It's not just the unfortunate circumstances. Now you see tribulation as working as doing something. It's not just an unfortunate thing. It's not just a tragic thing. It's unfortunate and tragedy that's working. It's actively doing something. It's producing something. In fact, um, I think, do I have, yeah, the word worketh. I, I, I wrote down what it means. Um, accomplish, achieve, to work out. Now, you now know something that that tribulation is, listen, accomplishing something, achieving something, working something out. Now, that's that that gives you a reason to to boast. That gives you a reason to to glory. That gives you a reason to to joy. Hey, my tribulation, it's not just an un. Un, you know, now I know even the world sometimes will embrace this language, but hey, if there is no God and, and all we are are just biological accidents by, produced by evolution, then you can pretend all day that, hey, you know, bad times teaches me good lessons, whatever. You can give you all these little things, but if there's no divine purpose in it, then you're just pretending that it's giving you something positive, all right? But from a Christian perspective, no, 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 no. We see that there is something spiritually occurring in the midst of it. The, there is the tribulation. We rejoice, glory, and boast in the tribulation because it's working. It's accomplishing. It's achieving. Now, what is it working? What is it accomplishing? What is it achieving? Well, Look at what it, it's supposedly doing. Now, look here. And not only so, but we glory in our tribulations. Also, okay, we, so, and when he says also, he's contrasting that with the, with uh, the hope of glory, all right? The hope of glory, we rejoice in the hope of glory. So not only do we have the future glory, but not only so, we glory in tribulations also, Right? Not just, hey, look, the future is wonderful. No, in the midst of tribulation, you are glorying in it. You are, you are rejoicing in it. You're boasting in it. Why? Because you know something. What do you know? Is that tribulation is working. It's working something out. It's accomplished something. And what is it working? What is it working out? What's the next word? Patience. Patience. It's working out patience. Now, what do we mean by patience, all right? The word here means steadfastness, const, uh, uh, endurance, and the idea of cons, 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 consistency, if I can say the word, constancy, consistency. It's working out as a steadfast, consistent 
kind of life. That's a way of trying to put it, all right? It's, it's the idea of endurance. It's working out endurance in you. It's working out a steadfastness in you. The only way you're going to get endurance, the only way you're going to get endurance is you need resistance. You build up your endurance by doing that where you push yourself to the point where you, you, you're pushing. And the more you push, you develop that endurance. The first time you say you have to, you know, you're in the military, you get your PT test and you've got to run whatever, a mile and a half, whatever it was. And, you, and, you, and maybe you're not used to running and you start running. You're like, oh, I'm going to die like they said, go, and I collapsed three steps later, okay? And I'm like, please bring me a Dr. Pepper and a donut now, okay? Emergency, emergency. Well, the next time they make you run, because they usually do so by force and threaten of punishment, ah, horrible people, okay? Then you have to run, you make it six steps before you collapse and ask for a donut and a, and a Dr. Pepper. And probably if you cut out the donuts and Dr. Pepper, it'd probably help you, but you get the idea. And the next day you can make it 12 steps and then you can make it 18. And then the next thing you know, you make it half a mile and you, and then next day, but you've got to keep pushing yourself. You can't just every day stop at three steps. You won't ever build endurance. You need this resistance. You've got to push past where it's difficult, where it hurts, where it goes. Well, guess what? I glory in tribulation. I rejoice in tribulation because it's working something. It's achieving something. What is it achieving? It's achieving steadfastness, consistency, endurance. It's building that into my life. Now, listen, this is very important. This is very important. You got you to hear what I'm about to say, right? Because I think these, I think the way this is sometimes preached is it's preached as a self improvement program. Hey, you want to be a better person? You want to be a better person? Well, then you rejoice in tribulation because it produces these things. You need to listen to what I'm about to say here because, because I'm, I'm going to try to kind of push against that kind of mindset that turns this into a, a, a self improvement program. This is not what's going on here. I glory in this. Now, listen, listen to me carefully. I rejoice in this because the tribulation, the difficulty is working in me a steadfastness and endurance, a consistency. Listen, for my spiritual good, there is a spirit. I think this is a spiritual improvement. Now, yes, can that in, uh, spiritual improvement demonstrate in my everyday life? It should, hopefully, but I want you to see it from a spiritual perspective, right? Because you, what, this is what a lot of people will say. Well, well, look, I, I could care less that I have more steadfastness and endurance in my life. I could care less. I could care less. I develop patience. Who cares? Uh, sometimes uh, you know, you'll hear pastors say, don't ever pray for patience. Because the only way you're going to get it is God's going to bring trial and tribulation into your life. Well, that's that's perceiving patience as just a quality for my everyday life. I'll be a more patient mom. I'll be a more patient husband. I'll be a more patient boss. No, this this is speaking of a spiritual quality. I think we have to see it because if we just see it from the physical, we may be tempted to go, I don't want that physical trait. We are talking about a spiritual transformation. Now, that spiritual transformation produces a better response physically. But listen, you should care about your spiritual state before God. You need a spiritual steadfastness. You need a spiritual endurance. You need a spiritual consistency. You need that. You want that. You desire that. Because you want to please God. You want to glorify God. Now, yes, that does show up in your physical life. But I'm just saying if we reduce it to a mere physical improvement, then we, we, we see, we, we, I think that gets us into too, too much of a fleshly materialistic mindset. We've got to go beyond that to the spiritual reality here. Now, now look what happens. Now look, okay, go back to the verse. I told you that's why we're only going to focus on one today. I told you because uh, there's so much here. All right. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Also knowing that tribulations worketh patience and patience, verse four, experience. 
patience, tribulation, right? Tribulation worketh patience, steadfastness, endurance. Then that steadfastness, endurance works experience. Please note experience. I want you to really get that that word. Experience means character, approved, tried character. Approved, tried character. Now, this is where it shows up in your life. This is where it shows up. The tribulation starts, and the tribulation starts doing a work that I think produces a spiritual steadfastness, a spiritual endurance, and then that endurance spiritually shows up in your tried character. It shows up in your character. So here's how it works. Here's the mathematical formula. Tribulation, boom happens. And I'm not going to reduce it to just persecution or something. I'm suffering just because I'm a Christian. I think this is common problems that we face, but we see them differently now. We don't see them as unfortunate circumstances. We see them from a divine spiritual perspective. We see, oh, look at that tribulation. It's going to work something. It's doing a work. Why? Because I'm, listen, because I've been justified. And God's going to ultimately glorify me. And in and, and the process of that justification and glorification, there's going to be a process of sanctification, right? And these things are part of that. It's a part of that sanctification we talked about in the last hour, right? Now, listen. So tribulation, patience, and next experience, or you could put character, character, a tried character a character that's been tried and has shown itself as coming through it. It's got the marks of being tried. It's got the marks. If you've ever watched a movie, um, this is a common technique. It's done in books. It's done in movies. It's a very common technique. You'll have this individual, maybe he's coming in, uh, there's a new Netflix movie that uh, does the same concept. They do the same thing, That a uh, new movie that was... Uh, added on Friday. Um, I won't get into all the symbolism and imagery and of death, burial, resurrection, baptism. I won't get into, because I could talk all day about the movie, but there is a, they, they, this is a common uh, idea. Here's the hero in the story, right? He's the one who's coming in to save the people, right? But the, the storyteller wants you to understand that this person has a character that's been tried through the difficulties, through war, through suffering. So at some point, they will show you, like the the, the hero will will remove their shirt or something will happen where you see their back and uh, on their back, you'll see all of these marks and scars. And you're like, oh, wow, they've gone through some horrible suffering. But it's not, the storyteller is not putting that there. So you go, wow, they've suffered. What you're supposed to do is go, wow, They've endured and they're still here. They're still going. They made it through that and they didn't give up. They made it through that suffering and they didn't stop. I mean, if I if my back looked like that, I would stop. I would have gotten out of this line of work. I would have quit. I would have I would declared myself retired. They're still in the fight. They're still they're still warring. That that's that's a soldier. That's a hero. They've suffered but yet endured. So so what happens is the trial produces the steadfastness consistency, which then ultimately demonstrates in a tried character, a character that shows itself, all right, demonstrates itself. And in a sense, storytelling, when they show you the marks, they're showing you the tried character of, the, of that particular character in the story. It's, a, it's an old technique. It's been used forever. You see it constantly in movies. I think sometimes people misinterpret it. Wow, look at he got messed up. You know, like that's not the point. That's not please don't tell talk to me about movies. Okay, but you get the idea, right? Yes, okay. Everyone should say amen. All right. Now, what happens? Please note, something else then develops. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. All right, we're 49 minutes. Okay, I'm gotta move quickly. I'm about out of time. Um Okay, uh, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulations work with patience. Patience, experience, there's the character, and experience, hope. Hope. 
then we end up with hope. Now here, this hope is joyful, confident expectation of eternal salvation. This hope is joyful, uh, confident expectation of eternal salvation. Now, this produces a hope in us. And what does this hope produce in us? Let me take a drink of water. Listen to this, how this hope works. <clears throat> Here I am, a Christian. I'm going through trial and tribulation, but I, hey, I, I'm going to rejoice. Why? Because I know it's working. What is it working in me? Steadfastness, endurance that will help me spiritually. That will help me develop spiritual muscles, spiritual strength, spiritual endurance. This then shows up in my character that has been tried. And this character then produces hope. Why? Why do I have hope? Why can I rejoice? Because I am seeing and witnessing God working in my life. I am witnessing this. Now, this is where you can get into some kind of, you know, some may call it an evidence but it's the but this evidence is developed over time so it's hard to ever judge it but it's it's we see that this is all we see God working in our life so then we get a hope I, I, and that's not a like i hope i'm saved we get a hope and assurance because we see that God is working in our life we 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 see this it's a it's a, and again the way i wrote down the definition of hope here joyful Confident expectation of eternal salvation. Joyful, confident expectation of eternal salvation. And look about this hope. Look at this hope. So look at verse four. And patience, experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Stop right there. Hope maketh not ashamed. It's... It's not to disappoint. This is not a hope that leads to disappointment. This is not a hope that, well, I hope for it. Oh, it didn't happen. No, this is a, this is a hope that will never disappoint because all of this process that is happening is demonstrating the work of God in our life. And the work of God in our life is guaranteed because of our justification. It is a result of our justification. This is the way it begins to work. There is tribulation. The tribulation works something in me. What does it work? An endurance, a steadfastness in my Christian life. Okay, it, it's a consistency. It produces something. What does that produce? Character, experience, tried character. And what does that produce? A hope that is not ashamed, that is not disappointed. It, it doesn't lead to a disappointment because it's God working in and through us. That is all a result of your justification. Now, I found this. I thought it was interesting. And I, I don't know enough Latin to know if this is 100% accurate. You may want to look it up. According to at least one source, our English word tribulation comes from a Latin word. The, the Latin word is tribulum. T-R-I-B-U-L-U-M. All right. So according to this one source, and again, I have not verified this, so hopefully this is accurate, but please check it for yourself. Don't state that this is 100% accurate. Question, 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 because uh, so many times you read things and then you find out it's not accurate. It would be disappointing if it's not accurate. If it is accurate, this is a wonderful illustration. Our English word tribulation comes from a Latin word tribulum. And Paul's day a tribulum was a heavy piece of timber with spikes in it used for threshing the grain. The tribulum was drawn over the grain and it separated the wheat from the chaff. As we go through tribulation and depend on God's grace, the trials only purify us and help to get rid of the chaff that is in our lives. Now, that's a powerful illustration. Now, but please note, this is related to your justification. So let's read it all together, and I'll stop. Let's read it all together. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Amen. We have peace with God. All right. Awesome. And we have this through Jesus, uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Next, because of Christ, 
We have access by faith into grace wherein we stand. We stand in that grace. We have access to that grace. Amen. Next, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The next thing you have is you have a a hope and an assurance of the glory of God that you're going to enter into glory one day. Your salvation is guaranteed. It is certain you're going to be kept by the power of God. God, If God predestined, if he called, if he justified, he's going to glorify you. You're going to end up in glory. All right. So this is the worst this is the worst life you're ever going to experience. This is as bad as it's ever going to be. You only have an eternity of glory where there's no more pain, suffering, death, or tears waiting for you. So this is as bad as it's ever going to be. So there's always a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not an oncoming train, right? There's some, there's the hope of glory, but not only that. Now this is where it gets to your daily life, but we glory and tribulations. We glory in it. We rejoice in it. We boast in it. We're happy for tribulations. We, there, there's, now we're not, we're happy for them. We're not happy. Uh, how can I say this? We're happy because of what they do. We're not happy because of the pain they cause. All right. Yeah. Tribulation and tragedy is horrible and you have every right to weep and you have every right, right to, 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 to experience sorrow. Don't let any Christian tell you you're not. But in that, please know something. There's something you should know that should produce a little bit of glory in you or a little bit of uh, boasting, a little bit of rejoicing, a little bit of joy, something that you can glory in. And that is, you know, it's working something. This is why Paul said he would, he would, he would boast in his weakness. He would boast in his trials and tribute. He would boast in them. He would celebrate them because he knew they were doing something. They were producing something. Remember the thorn of the flesh given to Paul? We believe that's Paul. It it, it kept him from being prideful. It kept him from being prideful. And he was like, my spiritual good is more important than my fleshly comfort. And that's, that's, that's the question you have to have. What's more important to you? Spiritual good or fleshly comfort? Sometimes we want fleshly comfort more than spiritual good. Let's just be honest. Okay, you're not more, any more spiritual than me. When it all when it all comes crumbling down, sometimes you're like, I prefer uh, that God, you take this tribulation away because I want some fleshly comfort. We sometimes don't care about the spiritual good, but please note, not only so, but we glory in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation is working something. And what is it working? Patience, steadfast, endurance, consistency, and this leads to what experience, character, and that what does this lead to? Hope. And what does this hope lead to? Not being ashamed, not being disappointed because we can see the work of God in our life. All right, I'll stop right there. 57 minutes, I will have to stop, all right? So there we have it. I hope I hope that was helpful. I hope it was helpful. I tried to work through that as in the most careful way I possibly could. Um, so let me know what you think. I'll stop right there. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning. The world right now is experiencing some great difficulties, economic difficulties that we have not seen since the Great Depression could be possibly coming. There are people who are infected with a virus. There are people who have died from that virus and their family members have lost loved ones. There's all kinds of difficulty and trials and tribulations around us and even even beyond just the, the, the pandemic that we're currently living through. There's all kinds of trials and tribulations coming upon churches, coming upon families. There's always, because we live in a fallen world, Lord. And I pray that we will now, I pray, Lord, that we would now possibly learn to see things from a spiritual mindset and not a fleshly mindset, that we would desire spiritual good over fleshly uh, fleshly good. And Lord, I know that that, that my way of thinking is so foreign to me. It's so foreign to everyone listening to me. Lord, I pray that this study will at least give us a desire to try to see things from that perspective and that you would help us do just that through your Holy Spirit. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.